find it as a job. There was no rock photographer job in yeah. those days. It wasn't even a big aspect of uh, photojournalism. But uh, I was doing it and, and doing a lot of it as a kid. A serendipitous encounter with the singer Brenda Lee in 1960 led John Rollins into a lifelong career taking photographs of some of rock and roll's biggest stars, from the Beatles and the Rolling Stones to Bruce Springsteen and Bob Dylan. One of his shots of David Bowie was the iconic picture used to publicize the recent exhibition about Bowie at the Art Gallery of Ontario. We met John Rollins in Ottawa. John, I wanted to start by asking you about uh, your very beginnings in, in this business because I've talked to a lot of photographers over the years and most of them say, you know, I got into it because I had a real interest in photography and I had a, you know, and I was interested in the technology and this and this and this. And you just seemed to sort of almost fall into it by accident because you had a crush on Brenda Lee. You got it, yep. <laughs> uh, I was in love with Brenda Lee. Uh, a, a camera at her show when she played Ottawa, Canada was uh, the only way I thought I could bring her home. <laughs> so uh, I got an advance on my allowance to buy the ticket. Mm -hmm. Your allowance being how much? Ten cents a Ten week. Ten cents, there you go. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And uh, my dad lent me his camera and uh, bought me 12 big, huge blue for color film flash bulbs. And normally a roll of film in, in the 60s would cover uh, two family reunions and the Queen Mother coming to Ottawa. <laughs> uh, I blew the whole 12 on Brenda and, and, and was desperate to find another roll but couldn't. Okay, so now people are thinking. How did you manage to pull this off? You were 13 at the time? 13, yes. 13. Sir. Yeah. So how did you even get to her? Well, uh, elbowed my way to the lip of the stage, got the shots, and then uh, in leaving the building, uh, you know, like today, sh security makes sure you leave just like at a bar. You know, time to go, folks. Uh, in those days, you just walked home or left the building. In leaving the building, I looked down a corridor, saw a little sign said Brenda Lee and the Casuals sticking out so you could see it. And I uh, thought, well, I'll just go down and tell Brenda I like the show. Knock on the door, her mother opened the door. Her mother? Yeah. <laughs> I said, I, I just wanted to, to thank Brenda for a good show. And she said, well, will you come in and tell her yourself? So I came in, sat down with her. We talked about everything from school to uh, being on the Perry Como show the week before. All of the stuff going on, I had all the Decca records she made, and uh, I was a huge fan. Uh, Brenda, you could hear her voice wherever you played the record, and uh, in my mind's eye now, now I had my proof of Brenda Lee 10 feet away from me. So, Okay, so you went home, you developed the pictures. I, I sent them to the pharmacy. Yeah. Oh, wait, yes, of course. Waited so, a week, yes. <laughs> got the little tiny square snapshots. And um, because they asked me for them, I, I mailed the snapshots to Nashville. Uh, post office box 50, I wrote it down, and uh, no zip code, it hadn't been invented. <laughs> and uh, maybe three weeks later, I get home from school and uh, uh, doing homework or whatever, and the phone rang, and uh, my mother came to me, as, as a good mother would in those days, John, there's a man on the phone for you. Uh, oh God! What did I do now? You know, and it was uh, Brenda's manager asking for the negatives to the snapshots I sent. Uh, if you'd send them down, we'll send you some money. No, uh, no amount discussed or anything. Right. And it didn't matter anyway. Uh, Brenda Lee's people were interested in my pictures, so down they went. And another three, four weeks later, an envelope arrives, and here's here's a check for thirty-five dollars. Thirty-five bucks. Yeah, not bad for a thirteen. Very old. happy kid with I'll a ten you. cent a week allowance. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Big time. I, I came down here to uh, William Street Pawn Shop and bought an electric guitar with the 35 bucks. <laughs> didn't know how to play it and didn't have an amp. So. Do you know if those shots were ever used? What, do they use them for any publicity purposes? Uh, you know? it, it wasn't in my realm to know, but I uh. think they probably were. Right. Uh, I, I didn't see any copies of them, and I, I kind of regret giving up the negs. Yeah. Snapshots have long gone. Absolutely. Uh, and basically, it's my memories. Yeah. You see, so. So what happened after that? How did it progress from there? Here you are, 13, well, you're uh, in school. You're Brenda Lee uh, people knew somebody else that was coming to, to, to Ottawa, Canada, and uh, said, gee, uh, we know a photographer up there. So I get a phone call from the man again, and uh, 
they tell me that he's doing the uh, Keith Sterling show, the Coca-Cola Club, at the uh, boardroom of the Independent Coal and Lumber Company, uh, a large room where they could accommodate kids to hear Keith do an interview. If you show up and take pictures of the entertainer, hand the roll of film to, the, to Tom, his manager, or whoever the guy was that was with him, he'll give you $50 cash. Chiching, I'll be there. And uh, so I went, I photographed it, uh, handed over the roll to Tom, I got my $50. He said, well, come on over here. I, w I want you to meet Sam. So he took me over and introduced me to Sam. I'd been listening to Sam's tunes uh, in the interview process. Uh -huh. And uh, he said, John, this is Sam Cook. Sam Cook. Sam's John Rose. Unbelievable. Yeah, number two <laughs> job. <laughs> Thanks to Brent. Your number two job. Yeah, yeah. And so it progressed from there. I mean, this is where, this is where uh, you know, in reading about you, one sees that you had uh, an instinctive entrepreneurial uh, streak in you because it then progressed beyond that. You're still going to high school, but this became a whole well, sideline. We, we all had uh, a teen screen magazine. Uh, Sixteen magazine was a big one in New York. I knew uh, Gloria Stavers, who was the editor, and she liked my photography from my angle of it all. So I, I kind of lived in the Sixteen magazine idiom for a little while and uh, uh, I ran into Fabian again uh, three four years ago and, and reminded him that I had hotel sessions of him in New York City where they flew this kid to New York to take pictures and I don't, I don't know whether I was the cheapest guy on the block for it for Gloria or what but she liked my photographs right. and used a lot of them so much so I got a New York agent to represent me with magazines like that yeah, and yeah. Tiger Beat came along another new sales venue and stuff and it was all just uh, give me something that I couldn't define it as a job there was no rock photographer job in yes. those days it wasn't even a big aspect of uh, photojournalism but uh, I was doing it and, and doing a lot of it as a kid you you and a buddy started your own little company essentially yeah, while my, you were still in high school yes my my good friend uh, Phil McDonald uh, son of the gentleman that built the 401 highway from Windsor, Ontario to Toronto uh, back when it was a million dollars a mile, was uh, my school pal, best friend, and we, we put a company together called Romac Productions. And I'd use his in-home office to make phone calls wherever I needed to talk to somebody important in person. I, I didn't like writing letters, and, uh, very few results through writing letters, but call get a secretary on your side and then find the big guy but see now this is where explain this to me because you're you're what age now you're 15 16 maybe yeah yeah so a 15 16 year old is calling you know some major guy's office talking to a secretary I'm surprised that you could even get through well in 64 I, I got into Capitol Records through a guy named Bill Bannon and Joe Woodhouse and I became their freelance photographer. In 63, I did four dates with Jerry and the Pacemakers for Capital Canada. Paul White was the A&R director there. And he needed the pictures for backs of album jackets and stuff coming out only in Canada. I think he called them the Capital 6000 series, if memory serves. But uh, Paul was very into it. He was Brit, so he could emulate what was going on in Britain. And we actually had the Beatles in Canada a year before right. the US. And uh, thanks to Mr. White, Mr. Woodhouse, and, and Bill Bannon, uh, I was the freelance photographer for Capitol Records at that point in time. And then uh, in 64, they, we, we did a one week with Dave Clark Five. And, and Phil and I got there uh, on the Greyhound bus. <laughs> and the, nobody said, uh, we'll pick you up or take the train or any of that. We just we figured out a way to go. Phil had a nice allowance, better than mine thanks to his father, and uh, we, could, we could afford to take the bus. But and you're going to school at this point. How do you get a week off? Were you just skipping school? Well, it's, I skipped school yeah. a week at a time. <laughs> okay. And then when I got back, you know, I had to see the vice president disciplinary. Yes. And he doled me out uh, 65 one-hour detentions, which were, you know, oh, my God. I mean, that's the extreme punishment. After two detentions, I got all my homework done for the day. And, and had a new uh, pattern now when, when mom would say after dinner, okay, kids, get down to doing your homework. i say, I already did mine in school, mom, at detention. You know? <laughs> now tell me about the, the, uh, 
how the technology for you was progressing as this went along? Because you started out with that little Kodak with the blue flash bulbs yeah, and everything. Yeah. How quickly did things change? How, how fast well, did you Well, it was a long time coming. Uh, probably, uh, say, in 1960 through to 1965, 66, and then I started discovering uh, Kodak had faster film. What I learned on was ASA, or ISO now, uh, 25 with German chemistry that came in vials. You'd have to break the end off to mix the chemistry. Everything had to be plus or minus a half a degree in the processing. And it was really long and very exacting and, and silly black and white. Color was totally out of the question to try. Yeah. So we didn't do it, but uh, everything was very slow. You had to shoot almost everything with flash or you had no hope of getting anything at all. Then Tri-X made things a lot easier because it was a contained film that you didn't have to push process. Uh, you could push it to 1600 with no trouble, and that allowed uh, available light photography in, in this type yeah. of environment. Yeah. Um, Did you ever take a course or anything? Did you ever have any formal no, training? No, but I, I went back to school because there were a lot of that technical information yeah. that was fast approaching that I didn't know anything about. So go in, learn by the book. So I, I signed into Ryerson took a year to get there. Uh, I, uh, I repeated grade 13 to added three subjects so I'd be faster in line to get into Ryerson. I got in second, second attempt and uh, they turfed me out of there pretty quick because I'd already learned uh, by self-taught and that was against the rules at, at Ryerson. I was ahead of some of the courses and, and did uh, night school with my friends and showed them how to do it not following the rules. So they came down hard on me, and I was in and out in a year, but I learned enough of the new technology right. to use it. And you were probably the one guy out of the, all the, the students there who was actually making money at this, I would think. Make, making money, and, and sad to say, too, the institution, uh, if you took in 120 students first year, only six of them had graduated at the end of the course yeah. after two or three years, whatever it was. Yeah. And, and the rest of them went into retail. They were selling at Simpsons the latest Kodaks and the latest up-and-coming single-lens reflexes. Yeah, so. yeah. All right, tell me about the bands now. Now, at some point, this starts because you have a crush on Brenda Lee. Yeah. Which, by the way, I find a little strange, but that's just me. Because <laughs> you and I are the same age, so I'm just thinking, okay, it wasn't Brenda Lee for me, I'm telling you. Well, she um, was 13, or I was 13, she was 15, so we're the same gang of kids. There you go. All right. But at that point, so, you, you know, that was that. But yeah. all the other stuff, like you didn't know who Sam Cooke was when you met no. him. But at no. a certain point now, you have to start realizing that you're being sent out to take pictures of musical acts that were now having a huge impact on yes. our generation. Yes. Right? At what point did you, did you think, this is, this is so cool, I can't believe I'm doing this? Yeah, uh, third act, Bobby V. Okay, there you go. Bobby V was all over radio in those days, probably... 15 hits, number one, top five, whatever, but heard everywhere, had a hairstyle everybody couldn't believe, uh, good-looking guy, so he was kind of like a senior in high school to every magazine you ever opened. Bob Dylan played in his band for a That's while. right, there yeah, for a week. Yeah, for a week. <laughs> and, and then went around telling everybody he was Bob Dylan. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So that, that was uh, the, the kind of, uh, I really understood that I really had a job in the industry of uh, the 16 magazine yeah. thing. And it was yeah. like, uh, uh, you only watch a certain channel TV, that I, I really liked my channel. Yeah. And everybody I met was somebody that uh, I could hear on the radio and say, gee, I kind of know that guy. Yeah. You know? So were you being um, told by record companies that they wanted certain kinds of shots, or were they just looking for candid stuff? What was your, did you have? Well, they left it up to me. Yeah. Uh, except for the backstage with the PR rep or the executives that they were presenting an album and stuff. There was a business side of it, the mechanical side of the mm -hmm. industry promoting itself, and then there was the creative side. So those would be all those shots you'd see in Billboard with the artist standing with all these record company weasels, and they've all got their arms around each yeah. other. Yeah, those that shots. That was it, yeah. You would do those as well. Yes. Yeah cover the corporate reason for being there and uh, you know most of my paycheck uh, and then uh, in some cases I would have to ask to have stage access in those days because the machine in the, in the US was pumping out everything that they wanted so 
uh, having a picture of Mike Love and the Beach Boys on a Canadian stage was no different than one in California or anywhere else right. in the States. So right. that wasn't a real demand thing at that time. And, and after a while, it began, could, could we some, see some of the stage stuff too? You know, For starters, the only reason I got requests for that was they could use it quicker in the trades or teen magazines in Canada were starting to sprout up. Right. And they wouldn't have to wait for the U.S. to supply. Yeah. Of course, no email attachments in those days. There you go. Yeah. So tell me about the relationship. Let's talk about some of the famous bands and some of the famous things. Well, and we should talk about the Bowie, the Bowie photographs that you took because, of course, one image of yours has been used for the show that was at the VNA and it's been in Toronto and it's moving around and, and that's the shot of him with yeah. the pretending to have a bow yeah, and arrow. the archer, yeah. Tell me about your relationship with him because I know that you, you have told a story about him going through some shots that you took and you being very nervous about well, like uh, one of the things I wanted to do for David and, and other important acts that I was on the road and contained with, I couldn't come home at night and process, I put a dark room in the hotel room, bathroom in my room. And uh, once returning, would uh, process the film, hang them up on hangers, and go to sleep for a few hours while the negatives dried. And then I had a little Durst 606 and larger in there. I could make contact sheets and, a, and an 8 by 10 if they said, well, I'd like to see this bigger. Uh, and, and quick turnaround, uh, RC paper came out in those days, so it would dry much faster. I, I didn't need a dryer. So. I don't know what RC paper is. What is A uh, glossy coat of plastic over it. Okay, all right. Uh, that simulated a gloss that you'd normally have to put on with a high silver drum dryer. Okay. Big, huge thing with a lot of electricity. Right. Uh, so. David said, let's, let's have breakfast in, in my room uh, tomorrow morning and uh, show me what you've got. So I shot 25 rolls of 12 that night, processed them, did the contacts, walked across. Did you get any sleep, by the way? I mean, you're shooting this stuff at a, at a concert. A you're little. You're processing all yeah. night and you're meeting him for breakfast. Yeah, I got some sleep. Yeah, okay. maybe four hours. Okay. But I got sleep and uh, walked in with, with 25 contact sheets of him on stage, two and a quarter negative size, and uh, he uh, has a magic marker or, or whatever the precursor was to magic markers, uh, Sharpie type thing, and uh, so he was ready to, to make some uh, notifications of what he liked, and uh, he went through three or four and no reaction, pulled them in and, and continued to flip through 10, 12, 15, 25, and and then he pinched them all into a pile again, and I thought, well, I'll just crawl out under the door and go back to my room. But he handed them to me and said, look, I like the way you shoot. You, you know what you're photographing. Pick out six and tell RCA those were my selections. Really? Yeah. He gave you that latitude? Yeah. That's something. And then he even turned around even more. He said, this one and this one I'd like you to blow up and, and send to me. Uh, I think he had an apartment in Munich. He wanted to hang them in Munich. Nice. Yeah. So that Archer shot was one of those shots? Uh, I don't know that that was no? one of them. Okay. Uh, after uh, getting home and, and looking at everything in detail and what I had, uh, I, I pulled that one somewhere down the line. Whether it was one of the ones uh, I, I checked off and gave to RCA, I don't think yeah. so, though. Yeah. I don't, I don't recall RCA ever using it. They used others from the tour, but not that one. But that one has become now an iconic shot in a very huge way, right? Yes. Hasn't it? It's oh, taken yeah. Off. yeah. Does that amaze you that years and years and years after you take a shot like this, suddenly it's got a photograph that's taken on a new yes. life? Yes. Oh, yeah. I'm very, very happy about it. It was my favorite photograph of my professional career. So Is that right? Top of the pile. Yeah. yeah. I have others close to it, mind you, but uh, uh, to me, it was uh, it kind of wrapped up what I did. Yeah. And uh, with somebody that is as timeless as it gets in this business. So. Yeah. Now, you've also done well with a Beatles shot that you took, too, right? Yes, yes. What was the shot? Well, uh, in, in 65, I'm backstage. I met uh, George Harrison and a sound technician that was uh, sitting with him chatting and uh, uh, got to know him at least uh, immediately face-to-face. -face. And uh, when they did their press conference a half hour later, they were seated in a row. And I'm out front, and this row, is there's no dynamic to it. They're a long table full of uh, tape recorders and the four guys uh, parallel to the table. So I asked George if he'd mind asking uh, John to stand and just slide in behind Paul and Ringo, and he did. Got up, and in the, in the first second that the, the formation came, he looked right into my camera. 
click, click. So I got it. Then they turned to another guy to the left of me and uh, did a shot, and I grabbed that, a perfect profile of the Beatles. Two great shots in two seconds. Yeah. And the first shot is, uh, has been around the world, was used in the Stan Lee Marvel comic. And, uh, is that right? It was used in a Marvel comic? Yeah. It's uh, 1978, the Beatles' unauthorized biography, Stan Lee's The Beatles. Really? Yeah, it was a super comic. I think it sold for two bucks. And, and a big surprise to me, I didn't know when it was coming out. My dad in Toronto was the first customer at the, at the big comic book store called the Snail's Pace or something on Queen Street. My dad snuck in and, and bought a copy for me and bought a copy for himself. Wow. And the next time I was visiting dad, because I, I was oblivious as to when it was being released. Right. And uh, huh. it was really interesting yeah. that my dad had kind of got a little buzz off because my father dropped me at Maple Leaf Gardens to take the first uh, Beatle Show's yeah. uh, pictures. Uh, so he kind of knew what he was doing and what I was getting into. Which Did you come across the Beatles later on? I, I did them the following year yeah. in, in uh, 66. Uh, I think it was on the same date, August the 18th, 1966. And then uh, I went out uh, for a week in 74 with George. Uh, in 69, I did the CBC uh, thing with John and Yoko in Toronto. Yeah. And uh, also met and, and hung around with them at Ronnie Hawkins on a couple of occasions. Uh, uh, Richie York and Annette York were out there taking pictures, so I didn't cross pollute anything. Right. So, uh, he spent uh, a week with George in 74, you said? Yes, sir. What was that? Were you on the road with him? On the road with George and Ravi Shankar. Yeah? Yeah. How was that? Uh, it was bliss. You know, uh, George was 126 pounds, and uh, in hotel rooms and whatnot before the show, because you assembled everybody before you went to the venue, we could talk about why did you use Stratocasters on Strawberry Fields, and we get into some of the the things that interested me. You yeah. know, uh, why do why did the Beatles with Rickenbackers and all this history in Germany with the German guitars suddenly switch to a Strat? You know, John had a flavor he was looking for in the middle of the session. Rickenbacker didn't get him the sound, so he and George went to the music store in St. John's Wood, bought a couple of Beach Boy guitars. <laughs> uh, Tell me about the Stones. When did you first come across them? 1965, yeah. uh, again in Ottawa. It was at the auditorium or the uh, Coliseum? It was at the YMCA auditorium, the auditorium? on Metcalf Street, okay. yes, sir. Yeah. 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 All right. A hockey rink type place. Yep. And uh, this is where uh, Romac came into it. We uh, got through thanks to a secretary in Montreal to uh, Mr. Zimmerman, who had the Canadian franchise office of London Records, Rolling Stones label. And we had to convince him that the, all the other companies were doing this type of photography now. And he said to me, well, why do I need pictures of the Rolling Stones on stage? He said, well, there's a lot of teen magazines around, sir, and if you, if you don't get them on the next issue after uh, the Stones are in Montreal, Toronto, and Ottawa, and London, Ontario, then you're going to miss... Uh, deadline and, and old news, uh, yeah. another issue away, is, is not going to be effective. It's hard to believe, when you think about it now, that people in that business would be that obtuse about this. Do you think that they would realize? Mr. Zimmerman was obtuse. <laughs> 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 but he said, okay, he said, if you and Phil can get your, make your way to Montreal, I'll cover all the bills after that. So did you meet the band? Did you meet the Stones when you were doing Walked that one? Walked into the arena and, and uh, went to the bathroom before I met them, and standing in the urinal next to me is Mick Jagger. So <laughs> I shook his hand on the way out, and we talked all the way to the dressing room, and, and uh, I had full access uh, until they went on stage. Uh, yeah. They did uh, a little bit of select press conference type things in those days, no official press conference. Right. Uh, in Ottawa, John Poser was setting up to do interviews and, and videoed everything, put posters on the wall and uh, that sort of thing and uh, interviewed the, the guys one at a time and mm -hmm. uh, back in those days Mick was saying things like uh, we're, we're doing everything we can now because we figure we might have six months to a that's, year that's and then right. it's all yeah. over <laughs> you know some friends of mine opened for them that night as in fact so yeah so I know I know the stories about those guys now did you come across them later on the stones in, in uh, other uh I, I was on the 65 or 75 tour right 72 tour and uh also i was the official photographer at the concert for the blind okay when uh, keith was sentenced to do yes. a concert yes. yes and that was the new barbarians with special guest mick jagger that's right the uh so what was it like being on the road with them especially in the 70s well uh, in uh, in the 70s it was aircraft 
and uh, in 75, Truman Capote came out. So it was, uh, it was all matter of fact. Everybody was uh, entrenched in this is how we do tours now. Yeah. Aircraft. Uh, Paul McCartney on one occasion had a DC-10. Uh, a la bedroom living room style, you know, couches instead of uh, rows of chairs and things like that. So it, it, it became commonplace, in, in a matter of fact, in 75 2 Jagger would jog to a lot of the shows, have to wear a ski mask and a trainer or a bodyguard right. beside them and, uh, and jog to the concerts. And the food also got better on the aircraft, too. It went from uh, kind of road food crap to uh, yeah. uh, health food. Now, w were you seen, uh, being the photographer that's sort of traveling with them, you weren't, a, well, were you the f sort of a fly on the wall kind of guy? Or were you careful about what you did and didn't take pictures of? Uh, I was the fly on the wall, but there was always politics. And yeah. I, I've never been on the dark side. I, I don't shoot uh, people tying off and shooting up and things like that. It's yeah. not my business. It's not show business, so I don't do it. Uh, Annie Leibovitz has a different set of rules, but uh, to me, it, it, I was just polite. Yes. And I didn't think that was part of rock and roll. Yeah. In those days, it certainly wasn't. We only have a couple of minutes left, and there are so many stories. So I, so I just want you to tell you just just to go through the roll decks in your head and tell me about one or two of the of the things that stand out from all of those years with some of those people. Who are the who are the really interesting ones? The ones that you like and the great. Well, you, you know, it, everybody has a different flavor and a different reason. You know, uh, uh, Bob Marley is probably uh, a real uh, uh, contender for top of the pile for me. Uh, he was a very joyous character in, in everything he did, and he personally just loved to dance and enjoy his music. And when he was having some health problems and they were going to amputate a toe, he was mostly concerned he wouldn't be able to dance. So all, all of that kind of stuff uh, has its own priorities in it. I also worked with people like Red Skelton and Vincent Price, which were a little off-center from rock and roll. But no kidding. Wonderful stories about great people and who they became through the media and their, and their film idioms, TV idioms, and that sort of thing was, was really, really nice to have and to have a, a special uh, minute or two to grab a shot yeah. and, and lock them up in the way I thought they should look. Are there people that you've dealt with over the years who were, by the time you got brought in to take shots, were familiar with the sort of thing that you did and were willing to accommodate you a little more because of that? Like, did your reputation assist you? After no, I, I don't. I never had a real reputation. I was more mechanical to okay. the record industry, and, yeah. and uh, anonymous was fine with me. Okay. Uh, there weren't a lot of photographic shows and, and parallel industries that I could uh, uh, enamor uh, the public with my persona, and it's still that way today. You know, I'm happy with what I was allowed to grab a window or two or a second or two, uh, and and show it now as as bringing back the, uh, the the memories of the day and the time with that music. Yeah, well, we'll show people your website address so they can take a look at some of these shots. Great. So this has been great, John. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, it's Ken, been a blast. <laughs> Thank you.